More states are starting to get back to business now with nearly three dozen at least partially reopening between today and the end of next week. 15 states will remain under those strict stay at home orders for at least the next two weeks. And as of this morning, there are now more than 1.1 million cases of coronavirus here in the United States with nearly 65,000 deaths. Two months ago at this time, there were only a handful of deaths. We have it all covered, starting with those states reopening for business. Blaine Alexander is outside a mall in Atlanta that is getting set to reopen. Blaine, good morning. What's the latest there? Well, Kristen, good morning to you. This is Lenox Square. It's typically one of the busiest malls here in Metro Atlanta, and retailers are hoping to recapture some of that energy once the mall opens on Monday. But just because shopping centers are opening, it doesn't mean that all the stores inside them are doing the same, as some people say that it's all happening too soon. For much of the country, it's the first weekend in a while like this. Many stores open and lockdowns increasingly lifted. I'm just so happy that we're getting to the start of the end of this. Across the country, 34 states are either loosening restrictions or have announced plans to do so. Among the most recent, Texas, where restaurants are welcoming hungry customers with limitations. You'll get a good meal, but you're going to stay healthy because we are practicing everything for the good health of everyone. A similar story in neighboring Oklahoma. Our Morgan Chesky is there. It is official. All non-essential businesses can reopen in Oklahoma, but not everyone's choosing to do so. Here at Stella Italian Cuisine, they're only opening up outdoor dining. The owner telling us they're still trying to find a way to coexist with the deadly virus. And in Alabama, people here are lining up not to shop, but to show up for court, with county courthouses now open for business. And this weekend, dozens of malls will once again open their doors to mixed reaction from shoppers. I think we're all antsy and anxious to get out for really any reason. I'm a nurse. I see what's going on every day at the hospitals. Uh, so, yeah, I think we need to just give a little time. Simon Property Group, the biggest mall owner in America, will open 49 malls and outlets in 10 states by Monday, offering masks and gloves to shoppers and implementing increased social distancing guidelines. Elsewhere, the call to remove restrictions is growing louder. In both Ohio and Indiana, protesters took to the streets to demand local leaders end shelter-in-place mandates. Back in Georgia. And what's it like to go inside of a store again and kind of resume some normal activity? It almost feels freeing to me. I've been at home with a little one and he's been going to work. But some employees say it's too soon. Kaylee Kleneef says she works at a mall that opens Monday and she does not look forward to going back. It is scary just because people are risking their health just to open stores that don't really need to be open right now. And guys, stores say that they're putting a number of measures in place to protect both the employee and the shopper. For instance, at Simon Malls, you'll notice some common areas taped off, like the children's play spaces or water fountains. Inside the food courts, they're getting rid of those reusable trays, and they will have both masks and hand sanitizer available throughout the mall for anybody that wants them. Kristen and Peter. All right, Blaine Alexander, thank you for that. The financial struggle is getting worse for millions of Americans who are dealing with mounting bills, rent payments that are due, and the decision about whether to risk their own health to get back to work. NBC's Kathy Park is in New York City with more on that this morning. Kathy, good morning. Peter, good morning to you. Tensions are rising among essential workers who say their employers just aren't doing enough to protect them from the coronavirus. And as we enter another month into this crisis, the rent is due and millions won't be able to pay it. All across the country, from Los Angeles, Philadelphia to New York, tens of thousands of tenants banded together in the largest coordinated rent strike in decades. I know a lot of families who couldn't pay the rent on April 1st, and now they're on the second month. Frustration and fear mounting for essential workers whose jobs have become more critical during the coronavirus pandemic. Employees staged sick outs Friday, coinciding with International Workers' Day, calling out companies like Target, Whole Foods, Amazon, and FedEx for more personal protective equipment and hazard pay. Target said these concerns are being raised by a small minority, while Amazon, which also owns Whole Foods, released a statement. 
We have invested heavily in their health and safety through increased safety measures and the procurement of millions of safety supplies and have invested nearly $700 million in increased pay. I am appalled. Healthcare workers also took to the streets. Nurses demanded better protections, saying they're being forced to work without policies ensuring their health and safety on the front lines. If the nurses are not safe, then the patients are not safe and the community is not safe. And inside meat processing plants required to stay open under the Defense Production Act, a new CDC report shows that 3% of workers in more than 100 facilities tested positive for COVID-19. Labor unions say employees need high quality protective gear and plants must be reconfigured for social distancing. They always were working side by side, shoulder to shoulder. Now they've got to keep their distance apart. The balancing act between safety and staying open, testing companies like never before. And while we saw worker protest stage all across the country yesterday, companies say that these groups were relatively small and operations were not interrupted. Kristen, Peter. Kathy Park in New York City today. Kathy, thanks very much. We now want to bring in NBC's senior business correspondent, Stephanie Rule. Steph, great to see you as always. You too. So we are starting to see these businesses slowly reopen, but I guess the key question is, are people actually going back to these businesses and how long until we can actually see an impact on the economy, Steph? Listen, any business is better than no business, but it's very complicated economically. For any business, big or small, the key is planning. And here's what we do not know. When exactly can all of these businesses open? Will customers come back? Will employees come back? What are all the new public health rules all these businesses will have to adhere to? And then last, is the supply chain fully functioning so you can actually do that business? Without knowing any or all of that information, it's going to be very hard to tell if businesses can function, and even if they can, at limited capacity, like 25 or 50 percent, there's very few businesses with margins big enough to survive on that. Steph, a lot of this comes down to consumer confidence here, right? The confidence of businesses to reopen, of customers to go back to those businesses. And a lot of that relies on testing here. What are employees saying about the idea of returning to their businesses right now and whether they feel safe? Okay, employees, employers, your average consumer, all of us would agree we need a lot more testing. And at this very moment, we don't have it. But for employees, this is very complicated because if your business is up and running again and you're called back to work, you've got to go back to work or you lose your unemployment benefits. And for many of us, specifically working families, You've now got to go back to work, and we don't have schools in this country. We don't have open child care, so it's complicated. And if you have a low-wage job that doesn't provide health care and you don't necessarily feel like you can be protected on the health front, there's a lot of people out there saying better to be safe than sorry, and they're forgoing that income and they're staying home. Steph, very quickly, the president's top advisor and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, said the country's going to be rocking again by July. Do you think that's a realistic timeline? Okay, you'll be hard-pressed to find too many economists that would say rocking, much more like rocky. But listen, everybody wants to get back out there. Everybody wants the economy to be booming again. But July 1st is 60 days from now. Do you know what we do July 1st? We pack it into outdoor bars and restaurants. We go to theme parks, water parks, beaches. And even if things are open, you know social distancing rules will be here. And you're not going to see people in places like that and that's how people make a whole lot of money in those yeah. summer months. Think about what it's like in beach and coastal communities. Right. They've only got a couple of months to make all that money. They're not going to be doing that. All right, Stephanie Rule tracking all of those developments for us. Appreciate it, Steph. Thanks. Steph, thanks. Now to the battle over beaches across the country. The fight is heating up in California where that state's governor closed beaches in Orange County on Friday because people there were not following social distancing guidelines. It, of course, has led to a big fight and to defiant protests. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin is in Huntington Beach, California this morning, the town at the heart of it all. Aaron, good morning. Good morning, Peter. On Friday, Huntington Beach took the state of California to court, a move to keep its beaches open. People here and across the country say closing beaches because of COVID-19 is a step too far. Friday in Orange County, California, defiance on the streets 
and on the beach. Let the people surf. Let the people hang out at the beach. It's BS. Huntington Beach is one of two Orange County towns taking legal action to block beach closure. This after Governor Gavin Newsom singled out the county, his response to these images, warning the pictures proof California's hard fought progress is in danger. We see the images we saw last weekend and in concentration of thousands of people, uh, we could start to see a spread again. Early Friday, the beach still busy. This is not what a closed beach looks like. There are people in the water, there's people walking along the water, there's people sunbathing. Police tell us they're asking people to leave. They're not telling them. Everyone we talk to here insists the governor's overreacting. Police tweeting these photos to show the crowds weren't that bad. People need mental health, they need physical health. That's going to be at the beach. It's going to be outdoors. Councilman Mike Posey voted to take the state to court, even though the latest numbers show Orange County's infections going up. You know, we need to go back to work. We need to get back to, to real life. How do you do that, though, when your numbers aren't going down? The numbers aren't going down rapidly enough, but they're, I think they're, that, not, they're, they're like kind of going up. Yeah. Last I checked. So is the flu. You know, we can't we can't live in a risk free world. In Florida, like California, several beaches closed. But Clearwater, infamous for these spring break images, set to reopen Monday. And on Friday in Texas, state beaches back open. It's just nice to get out and see people again. Back in California, the tiny county of Modoc announcing it's open for business. Yet another act of defiance against governor's orders. On Friday, a California Superior Court judge sided with the state. This beach remains closed for now. The next hearing is May 11th. Guys. All right, Aaron McLaughlin in Southern California. Aaron, thank you. Meantime, there may be some promising news in the fight against coronavirus. NBC News has learned that scientists have been given the green light to experiment with more than a dozen potential vaccines. This as President Trump announced that an experimental drug can now be used to treat the sickest coronavirus patients. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is at the White House with more on all of the overnight developments. Kelly, good morning to you. Good morning, Kristen. That effort on vaccines comes as the president spent his first night away from the White House in eight weeks and made his first visit to Camp David in eight months. Mr. Trump says he'll use his time at the presidential retreat to make phone calls related to the pandemic response as his administration steps up its work to find medical therapies and to make a new vaccine. Branding a new vaccine experiment as Operation Warp Speed, officials tell NBC News clinical trials will begin on 14 potential vaccines, fast-tracking a process that may produce a patient-ready vaccine as early as January. No guarantees. The president eager for breakthroughs. They're going to open safely and quickly, I hope, because we have to get our country back. President Trump announced Friday an emergency use authorization from the FDA to treat hospitalized patients with an experimental drug called remdesivir. It's really a very promising situation. In trials, remdesivir was shown to shorten recovery time. The drug maker, Gilead, promised to donate 1.5 million doses. We um, feel a tremendous responsibility. New tension over access to Dr. Anthony Fauci. The House Appropriations Committee announced that the White House blocked a request for Fauci to testify at a hearing on the federal response next week. The White House called the request, while Fauci is still needed for the response, counterproductive. With a shift away from coronavirus task force press conferences, the first briefing by a press secretary in more than 400 days, as Kaylee McEnany began her tenure with a pledge. I will never lie to you. You have my word on that. McEnany was pressed to explain the president fueling an unproven theory that the virus began in a Wuhan, China lab. We'll be talking to you about it at a later date when we really know some good hard facts. Right. But I've seen a lot of things. The Thursday statement from the director of national intelligence said the U.S. concurs with a wide scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified. I consider that consistent with what the president said, that he's seen intelligence suggesting it could be in the Wuhan laboratory. And in a twist involving Dr. Anthony Fauci, although the White House is blocking him from appearing at a House committee, which is led by Democrats, they have given him the go-ahead to testify before a Senate committee later this month. And that, of course, would be run by Republicans.
Peter, Kristen. All right, Kelly O'Donnell at the White House. Thank you, Kelly. Former Vice President Joe Biden is now speaking out, denying an allegation of sexual assault by a former Senate staffer who says it happened 27 years ago and a warning some of the details as alleged are graphic. NBC's Jeff Bennett has more this morning. Jeff, good morning. Hey, Peter, good morning to you. For weeks, many Democrats had urged Joe Biden to offer a more forceful response to that sexual assault accusation, and now he's done just that, flatly and emphatically denying that allegation that dates back nearly 30 years. Former Vice President Joe Biden breaking a month-long silence, denying an allegation of sexual assault by former Senate aide Tara Reid. Biden speaking Friday in an exclusive interview with Mika Brzezinski on MSNBC's Morning Joe. Would you please go on the record with the American people? Did you sexually assault Tara Reid? No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. Reid and other women had said a year ago that Biden made them uncomfortable with unwanted but non-sexual touching. Biden at the time issued a statement saying, not once, never did I believe I acted inappropriately. If it is suggested I did so, I will listen respectfully, but it was never my intention. In March, Reid for the first time publicly accused Biden of holding her against a wall in a Senate corridor and assaulting her when he was a senator and she briefly worked on his staff. And I remember his hands underneath my blouse and underneath my skirt and his fingers penetrating me as he was kiss, trying to kiss me and I was pulling away. Do you remember her? Do you remember any, any types of complaints that she might have made? I don't remember any type of complaint she <clears throat> may have made. NBC's Ali Vitali has spoken with Tara Reid multiple times over the past several weeks. Tara Reid previously told me that she filed a complaint with a Senate personnel office in 1993 that complaint, though, regarding sexual harassment she says she experienced while in Biden's office, not this alleged sexual assault. No record has been found. Biden on Friday requested that the secretary of the Senate find and publish any complaint. I don't know why after 27 years all of a sudden this gets raised. I don't understand it. But I'm not going to go in and question her motive. I'm not going to attack her. President Trump, who denies credible accusations of sexual misconduct by more than a dozen women, expressing some sympathy for his political rival. All of a sudden you become a wealthy guy, you're a famous guy, then you become president. And people that you've never seen, that you've never heard of, make charges. So I guess in a way you could say I'm sticking up for him. Now, NBC News has reached out to Tara Reid for a response to Biden's interview. She has not responded. And you might be wondering why this allegation is coming out now, given that Joe Biden has been a fixture in public life for decades. Well, NBC News reached out to the man who vetted Biden to be Barack Obama's running mate. William Jeffers tells us that his group of lawyers found no evidence of misconduct of any type on Joe Biden's part. Peter, Kristen. Jeff Bennett with the latest on all of it this morning. Jeff, thanks. We do have some breaking news overseas now. North Korean state leaders, leader Kim Jong-un has reportedly made his first public appearance in weeks amid rumors about his health. On Friday, North Korean state media released video and photos of Kim attending a celebration at a fertilizer plant. He'd not been seen in 20 days and missed two national celebrations, leading to speculation that he was seriously ill or even possibly dead, NBC News has not independently verified that these images are new.